Without question, one of the most important issues we Seventh-day Adventists need to understand is the relationship of Ellen White's writings to the Bible. So many Adventists miss that boat. And there's a major campaign against Seventh-day Adventism and Ellen White. And one of the charges is that we raise Ellen White to the level of the Bible. And that's one of the areas I specialize in is responding to the critics or criticisms of Ellen White. So I want to address the topic of Ellen White and the Bible tonight. You'll notice there, uh, you'll see the Bible right here and the writings of Ellen White. It's important to understand that her writings chronologically, chronologically come after the Bible. So I want to talk about that issue. But first, let's look at a key passage. Revelation 12, 17. This is a key text for Adventists, a key text in the Bible. If you read the book of Revelation, it comes to a climax, a crescendo, an apex. And the center of it is chapters 12, 13, and 14. And chapter 12 is an amazing chapter in, in the Bible, in, in the book of Revelation. It, it gives the cosmic sweep, sweep of church history with the crucifixion of Christ and the war in heaven. And they overcame the devil and his angels through the blood of Jesus. And it comes to the persecution of God's church down through the ages all the way to the end of time. And Revelation 12, 17 reads, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So here we have the characteristics of God's people at the end of time. Now you know what the dragon represents. What? Satan. And the woman represents the church. And the remnant represents the last part. That's the meaning of the term. The last part, a sowing term. The last piece. The remnant. God's people at the end of time. And they're characterized two ways. Two characteristics. They keep the commandments of God... And they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And if you look at the context of the passage, in chapter 11, John sees the temple of God open. He sees the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. That provides the parameters for interpreting the rest of it. So when he mentions the commandments of God here, he's not just talking about, as some say, the New Testament commandments of Jesus. It certainly includes that, but he's specifically talking about what is in the Ark of the Covenant, which is none other than the Decalogue. The Ten Commandments. So when he says these people keep the commandments of God, he's talking about the Ten Commandments. But what is interesting is the commandments of God are in a parallel form with the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now that phrase, testimony of Jesus Christ, is the second characteristic of God's people. It says they have that testimony. They have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now this phrase, testimony of Jesus Christ, is important to John. He refers to it several more times in the book. What exactly is it? Well, if you just look at the phrase by itself in the original Greek New Testament, the testimony of Jesus, it could be interpreted two ways. A testimony about Jesus or a testimony coming from Jesus. If it's a testimony about Jesus, then it could be then a testimony that every person of the remnant has. Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so. Let me tell you my testimony about Jesus. But it could also be interpreted a testimony coming from Jesus. If it's interpreted that way it's a prophetic message from Jesus. A self-revelation of Jesus. Which way do we interpret it? You look at the phrase in its context. And in the immediate context the testimony of Jesus Christ is in a parallel connection or parallel relationship with the commandments of God. It's very clear that the commandments come from God, don't they? They originate from God. He spoke the Ten Commandments. And since it's in a parallel form, then the testimony of Jesus must be interpreted as a testimony issuing forth from Jesus, coming from Jesus. Therefore, we can see right in its immediate context that God's people are those who keep the commandments of God and they possess a prophetic word. From Jesus, a self-revelation from Jesus, a prophetic message from Jesus. Now, some say, well, that if it's that, if that is the case, then the testimony coming from Jesus is what's found in the Gospels. Jesus' word in the Gospels. The Gospels contain the teaching of Jesus that came from Jesus, and certainly it would include that, wouldn't it? 
But the way John uses this phrase later on provides greater clarity and make any greater clarity, I should say. He makes it abundantly and explicitly clear that this testimony is more than just what Jesus said in the Gospels. It is something he says prophetically at the end of time. It's a special self-revelation of Jesus to this remnant living at the end of earth's history. So where does John mention this phrase, testimony of Jesus, again? Well, it's in Revelation 19.10, and you find that it's in a parallel form. John is fascinated with this phrase, the testimony of Jesus. So he refers back to it in Revelation 19.10. He sees a big angel, and like any of us, he's overwhelmed with this celestial being. He falls down to worship this angel, and the angel will have none of that. Worship is for God alone. So we read what happens. John says, and I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said unto me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brethren that hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, and I've color-coded the phrases here, for the testimony of Jesus, he repeats it, but he defines it now more specifically. But the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now that phrase, spirit of prophecy, is an interesting one. It's found only once in the Bible, and that's right here. And what does it mean? Well, the closest parallel to it is when Paul mentions the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4. He speaks of these gifts, gifts of healing, gifts of teaching, and then, of course, he speaks the gift of a prophet. And he gives a hierarchy of the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, and he puts the gift of prophecy way up there. And these gifts originate from the Spirit, the Spirit of healing, the Spirit of teaching, the spirit of prophecy. So, the testimony of Jesus being the spirit of prophecy is a prophetic utterance. But John's not finished with it yet. He wants to give abundant evidence to his readers what this testimony of Jesus is. Evidently, it is, it is very important for the people of God at the end of time. So he makes a reference to it one more time. And what we find here is that Revelation 19, 10 is in a parallel structure with chapter 22, verse 8 and 9. Now here's 19, 10. I want you to notice what happened. John, again in chapter 22, records his encountering of a big angel. And he hasn't gotten it yet. He falls down again to worship this angel. And here's what happens. I fell down to worship, him at the, uh, to worship him at the feet of the angel who showed them to me, but he said unto me, you must not do that. You see the uh, parallel connection here? Clearly he's echoing that former passage to show a connection here. And down here, you have worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And over here, it's slightly different, but you have a clear parallel wording, and with those who keep the words of this book, worship God, worship God. But I've left out the center part here. Over in 1910, I'm a fellow servant with you and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. So notice, brethren, testimony of Jesus. Watch what happens in 22, 8 and 9. I am your fellow servant with you and your brethren, and I've color-coded this, your brethren, the prophets. You see what's happening here? Over here, brethren, the testimony of Jesus. Brethren, the prophets. The prophets further defines the testimony of Jesus. John makes it very clear that the testimony of Jesus is the manifestation of a prophet. It's a special prophetic utterance coming from Jesus. It's a self-revelation of Jesus himself at the end of time. It's appropriate to call it the testimonies. It would be a message that would glorify Jesus, uplift Jesus, and speak about Jesus. And I can't think of anyone who claimed the prophetic gift in the end of time that does that better than a little lady named Ellen G. White. Ever heard of her? Seventh-day Adventists believe that the testimony of Jesus, the fulfillment of that, was manifested in the life and ministry of Ellen G. White. Now, a little caveat here. I tell my students when I lecture on this that we must be careful to understand that Ellen White's DNA is not encoded in this text. It's speaking of the prophetic flow at the end of time that God's people would have. That doesn't mean that Ellen White exhausted it. It might come again. 
I don't think it has yet in full force. We'll know when it does. But without question, her 70 years of prophetic ministry is a significant part of that fulfillment. When you look at prophecy and down through history, no one else fills it, fulfills it like she did. And you connect the timing of her gift with the great time prophecies of Daniel, the Daniel 8, 14, the 2300 days reaching its fulfillment in the 19th century, 1844, October 22, 1844. Two months after that, Ellen White had her first formal vision. When you connect all of that together, without question, she is a part of this fulfillment. So this is a gift that God's people have at the end of time. Now one more, one more uh, point I want to make on this text before we get into the relationship of her writings to the Bible Notice the phrase, it says, and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They have. That word have is a very special and important word in this context. It's the Greek word, it's pronounced echo. Not like you hear an echo, but it means literally to have personally, to possess. I see a couple of my former uh, students years ago, we took Greek together at Southern. You guys remember echo? A personal possession. It means ownership, personal ownership. In other words, God's people personally possess this prophetic gift. Now, that doesn't mean that every one of us has the gift of prophecy, can speak words of prophecy. It means collectively God's people possess that gift. We are stewards of that gift. That means we are responsible for how we use it. And it's a precious gift to us collectively and to us individually in terms of how we relate to it. It's a special message from God to our church collectively, but it's a special in-time message for us as individuals. Are you listening to Jesus' special last day word to you? All of that's wrapped up in this passage. So it's a special gift to be manifested at the end of time. But the big question is, okay, it's a self-revelation of Jesus. It's a message of Jesus beyond what is contained in the four Gospels. It's beyond biblical times. It's a post-biblical message. This begs the question, what is its relationship to the closed canon of Scripture? To the Bible? We Adventists have an understanding about this. But I think it's something we need to seek maximum clarity about. So let's look at that tonight. What is the relationship of this gift to the Bible? Well, you have here the biblical canon. The term canon is a technical term. It means a standard or criterion by which other things are evaluated and judged. The closed canon of the Bible, the 66 books of the Bible, became the measuring rod, if you will, for all other writings. And Christians have considered it a closed canon, which means you cannot add anything to it. In fact, at the very end of the, the Bible, John says there's a curse to anyone who adds to or takes from the words in this book. Now, in that immediate context, he's speaking specifically about the book of Revelation. But when you look at its position at the end of Revelation, the end of the Bible, it can have that broader application to all of the Bible. You cannot add anything to the Bible. It is the final authoritative Word of God. Amen? That's a stance every Seventh-day Adventist should take. Sola Scriptura, the battle cry, battle cry of the Reformation. Sola, alone. Scripture, Scripture alone. The Bible and the Bible alone. So where does Ellen White's writings fit then if she has the prophetic gift with this? That is what we must look at. And so we're looking at the relationship of those writings to the closed canon. Now, at this juncture, it's helpful to understand the difference between canonical prophets and non-canonical prophets. Canonical prophets are those who wrote books of the Bible, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Paul, Moses. They contributed to the canon of Scripture. But non-canonical prophets are those whose writings are referenced in the Bible and their prophetic activity is referenced, but they made no contribution as far as the book is concerned, to the Bible. You have the book of Yashir, the book of Gad, the book of Nathan. See, they're mentioned in these various places in 2 Chronicles. You've got Elijah, the prophet, 
mentioned, Enoch, phrase, you know, sayings from Enoch, Elijah, and Elisha, but they never contributed a book to the Bible. Let me give you an example. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Elijah chapter 2. What are you laughing at? That's right. There is no first Elijah. But was Elijah a prophet? Was he any lesser of a prophet than Jeremiah? No. He had the prophetic gift. God spoke to them at that time. Why did some of the writers, why did the book of Gad or Nathan never appear in the Bible? God had his reasons. But those books were an inspired message to God's people at that time. The point is, One can have the gift of prophecy and not contribute a book to the Bible. So you have canonical prophets and non-canonical prophets. Ellen White's role, you'll notice here, she comes after the closing of the canon. The Bible itself, and we won't look at all the verses, the general teaching of the Bible, it clearly teaches that the prophetic gift would go beyond Scripture, that it would be manifested after the closing of the canon, that the gift of prophecy would be around to the very end of time. Now, there are some Christians who are cessationists. That is, they believe that the gift of prophecy and the other gifts ceased, cessationists, ceased at the closing of the canon. But Seventh-day Adventist and other groups believe that the gifts continue, one of those being the gift of prophecy. So Ellen White's role or the technical term to describe her, is a post-canonical prophet, or post-biblical prophet, if you will. The very nature of her prophetic activity is defined by its chronological position in relationship to the Bible. Since she comes after the Bible, since her prophetic utterances are outside of the canon, they can never be equal to the canon or supersede the canon. The very nature of her prophetic activity must bow before the Bible. That's just common sense. When you read the, the, the Scriptures, the Bible itself makes it clear it is the final authoritative word for God's people. So anything after that must be subordinate to the Bible. But how does that work? Let's, let's look at it further here. And let's discuss the post-canonical prophetic gift. What, what is its function, the post-canonical gift? I want you to notice here this little outline. You have the, the, the order of the revelation in the Bible. The initial revelation came through Moses who wrote the first five books of the Bible. That's the initial revelation. And there's a, a culmination here, a climaxing. I want you to notice. And then after the first five books of the Bible that Moses wrote, the Pentateuch, you have the Old Testament prophets. So the prophets based all their writings on the Pentateuch. They were applying the Pentateuch. So it's further revelation, but it's really application of all the blessings and the curses contained in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and so forth. So it's continuing revelation. Now, we all know as good Sabbath-day Adventists that the Old Testament's going somewhere, don't we? It's moving towards something. It's pointing towards something or someone. That's the Mashiach in Hebrew. The Messiah, it's pointing. And when the Messiah comes, He's the apex of God's revelation. So it climaxes in Jesus Christ, the final revelation. He's the apex of God's revelation. He's the ultimate of God Himself manifested, Jesus Christ. The four Gospels, in many ways, are the center of the Bible. Everything pointed towards them. The entire Old Testament was moving towards the four Gospels, the life and ministry and teachings of Jesus Christ. And the rest of the New Testament can only point back to it. So in the rest of the New Testament, you have the apostolic witness and interpretation of Christ. That's what the writings of Paul and John and Peter do. They are giving an inspired interpretation of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. You cannot go beyond Jesus Christ. He is the apex of God's revelation. Now, Frank Holbrook, who taught at Southern, where I teach, years ago when I was a student there, I took classes from him. Rick, did you take anything from Holbrook? That's right. Yes, sir. He was a great teacher. But he wrote this. He was one, his, all of his writings 
I think, are some of the most clearly expressed ideas I've read by anyone. And this is how he put it. He said, since Christ's life on earth and the apostolic interpretation of it provide the ultimate revelation of God, no function of the prophetic gift subsequent to the New Testament can equal, supersede, or be an addition to its unique witness. But rather, all claims to the prophetic gift must be tested by the Scriptures. I think he said it quite clearly, didn't he? Now, this may be an idea that's very clear in your mind, but it is amazing how many among us are confused about it. And it's one of the areas that our critics are most aggressively after us on. So we've got to speak with great clarity on this issue. So let's continue to expound this, this concept. The post canonical manifestation of the prophetic gift, whenever it shall appear, will be similar to its function in the time of the apostles and will carry with it the authority of the Spirit who speaks to the church through it. Now, what are some functions of the post canonical prophetic gift? And how did it function in the formative years of our church? The function can, will manifest itself as follows. It will point back to Holy Scripture as the basis of faith and practice. Without question, you read Ellen White from start to finish. She never pointed beyond the Scriptures, always back to the Scriptures. Her major focus was applying the Bible. She never added any truth to the Bible. She applied the Bible. Critics will say, well, she added the sanctuary teaching. No, she did not. If you read carefully what she said, she applied that teaching. Our pioneers derived that teaching from the Bible and the Bible alone. You read all the articles in the Review and Herald for almost a century, and all their arguments about the sanctuary in heaven, not once did they ever quote Sister White. Their arguments were from the Bible and the Bible alone. So that's a part of our tradition, our history. Ellen White applies the Bible. It will illumine and clarify teachings already present in Scripture. Indeed, that's what she did. It will apply the principles of Scripture to daily life. And I would argue, as many of my colleagues do, who teach Ellen White, that her major function was to give us inspired applications of the Bible. And that's why you, when you read Ellen White, it's so authentic and powerful. Her devotional applications speak directly to the heart. For example, read Desire of Ages. What a powerful read. Or Patriarchs and Prophets. And my favorite, many people's favorite, Steps to Christ. Applications that go right to the soul. If you want to grow in your faith, that's the best kind of reading outside of the Bible. This is sluggish here, gentlemen. Maybe it's the battery. It may be a catalyst to direct the church to carry out its commission as charged in the Scriptures. And that's precisely what she did. If, if you look at our church history, if it weren't for Ellen White and her prophetic guidance, our pioneers went off on so many rabbit trails of false doctrine. She pulled them back to the scriptural track again and again and again. It may assist in establishing the church. That almost goes without saying her formative role in establishing the church. I have the privilege of teaching Adventist history to our young people. I've taught Adventist heritage for 15 years and I never cease to be fascinated in that class, going through the history of our movement and showing my students the role, the vital role that Ellen White played in the formation of this church, in the establishment of this church. As Arthur White, her grandson, put it, who directed the White Estate for many years, the unfolding of, El the unfolding of Ellen White's life really is an unfolding of the early years of our church. The two go hand in hand. So she played such a vital role. It may reprove, warn, instruct, encourage, build up, and unify the church in the truths of Scripture. Without question, the gift of prophecy manifested in Ellen White is one of the mo major unifying factors in the Seventh-day Adventist church today. And whenever individuals or groups or even churches reject that gift, you find factions, you find disagreements, you find divergent paths. 
It may function to protect the church from false doctrine and establish believers in the truth. And I alluded to this already, but again and again, she kept our pioneers from going down the path of false doctrine. And I could give you lecture after lecture on that subject. So here we have these body of writings. What a blessing they are to us today. This is Ellen White's legacy. Are we really treating it like we should? Are we reading it more or the Bible more? Trick question. Think about it. Here's a visual, which will become pretty obvious to you, but I want to make some points with it. Here are the writings of other men down here. Good Christian writers over the ages, contemporary, have a lot of good thoughts, Christian thoughts. Here is the Bible. Where do the Ellen, writings of Ellen White fit? Are they up here on an equal level with Scripture? Well, obviously after the last 10 minutes of this presentation, we would argue no. And we would also argue no, they're not up here. But you know what I find? There are a number of Adventists while they agree with this in theory, that of course the, Bible, the writings of Ellen White are not above, not above the Bible. They agree with that in theory. But in practice, you will hear them quoting Ellen White more in church than quoting the Bible. And maybe even reading Ellen White more than reading the Bible. That's a mistake though, isn't it? Certainly there's a place for the writings of Ellen White we want to share with people many of those encouraging words and insights that she has. But where does the Bible fit? If the Bible is the final authoritative Word of God, it should receive supremacy in church, in Sabbath school. Amen? The opposite extreme is putting them down here, and this is happening in many, many circles today, where the writings of Ellen White are viewed devotionally. Oh, it's a devotional word to me, but that's as far as it goes. They don't really have any prophetic authority. I believe that's a wrong position, just as wrong as the opposite extreme. So where do these writings fit visually here? It's pretty obvious, isn't it? You know where my next slide is going, don't you? Right there. They're above the writings of other men because of the quality of her inspiration. But they are beneath the Bible in terms of authority. Now here's something I want to just mention that we could spend a whole hour on is the nature of her inspiration. In the Bible, there are no degrees of inspiration. The non-canonical prophets are just as inspired as the canonical prophets. So there are no degrees of inspiration. In the history of our church, some came up with a theory of degrees of inspiration, but that's nowhere taught in Scripture. Now let me ask you, can a pregnant woman be partially pregnant? No way. Especially our, our ladies would argue that. You are pregnant or you are not pregnant. You are inspired, fully inspired, or you are not inspired at all. Therefore, if Ellen White had the gift of prophecy and was inspired, the inspiration of her writings, the quality of her inspiration, that is, is no different than the Bible writers. She's inspired to the same degree that Jeremiah, Peter, and Paul were inspired. And this is where some people might get a bit confused. Well, then if she's inspired exactly as the Bible writers are, then she is equal with the Bible. She's on the same level with the Bible. No. There is a difference between her inspiration and her authority. Because the Bible, as I said earlier, spells it out that it is the final authority for God's people. And the telltale sign of the true prophetic gift, or true post-canonical prophetic gift, is that it exalts the Bible as the final Word of God. And that's precisely what Ellen White did in her writings. So the quality of the inspiration is the same, but her writings clearly point back to the Bible as the final authority. And in a book that I wrote about Ellen White's prophetic ministry, I have two chapters on inspiration because it's so important and two big chapters on authority. 
It's dealing with the critics of Ellen White. And those are issues that, that are brought up all the time and must be dealt with. And it's that important. I had to spend all this, these chapters on these subjects because it's vital. The phrase that she used, the, the imagery that's most familiar to us all, she said her writings are a lesser light to lead to the greater light. That's the phrase that she used. Let's, let's look at a few statements she makes about the status of the Bible, then analyze in more detail that phrase, lesser light, greater light. She said in Great Controversy, one of her very important books, as you, you all know, at the very outset in the introduction when she's describing insp the inspiration and authority of the Bible, she says this, the Holy Scriptures are to be accepted as the authoritative, infallible revelation of His will. They are the standard of character, the revealer of doctrines, and the test of experience. There's the post-canonical gift at its best. Exalting the closed canon of Scripture. Exalting the Bible. She does this many times. It's all throughout her writings. In fact, that was her favorite practice, is to exalt the Bible, along with exalting Jesus. Several for, uh, statements from her writings. She called the Bible the unerring counsel of God. By the way, some of the phrases she used for the Bible the unerring counsel of God, the Word of God, she never uses those phrases to describe her writings. Even during her day, some of her mistaken followers described her writings as the Word of God and used phrases for Scripture to describe her writings. She would have none of that. Not because she didn't recognize her own inspiration, but because she wanted the church to understand clearly the final authority of the Bible. All that is needful for the saving of the soul, she said about the Scriptures. Her testimony, she said, should not be carried to the front, nor are they to take the place of the Word. Young and old should read the Word, she said, and not only should they read it, but they should study it with diligent earnestness, praying, believing, and searching. Thus they will find the hidden treasure, for the Lord will quicken their understanding. And this is my favorite statement of all her writings about the Bible. In Testimonies, volume 6, page 393, she said, The Bible is God's voice speaking to us just as surely as though we could hear it with our ears. If we realize this, with what earnestness would we search its precepts? The reading and contemplation of the Scriptures would be regarded as an audience with the Infinite One. Isn't that a powerful statement? Doesn't that make you want to just go to your cabin tonight or your camper and read the Bible? God's voice speaking to us just as surely as though we could hear it with our ears. To read the Bible, to listen to those words, to hear those words is God's audible voice speaking to you. What a privilege. See, that's one blessing of the gift of prophecy. She highlights for us the importance as well as the blessing of reading the Bible. When I was a young man and after, shortly after I was converted to Adventism through the Kinnecox meetings, I, I was given the book Steps to Christ and I remember reading through it. And in my college years at Southern Missionary College at the time, I remember reading Ellen White's books. I read more in Ellen White than I did my textbooks. And my grades showed, but I learned a lot still. But I remember, and somehow the Lord blessed me, and I was able to read those writings correctly. And they didn't become the end. They became a means to the end. They led me into my Bible. I found the more I read Ellen White, the greater was my appetite to read the Bible. The more I wanted to read Scripture. And to this day, I cherish the Bible because of Ellen White's influence in my life. It is the most important book in my life because of Ellen White. And so I want to say to you what I like to say to different groups. I want you to read Ellen White. There is a blessing in reading Ellen White, but I want you to read your Bible more. That's what she would want. Now to the lesser light, greater light phrase. This is its context. In an open letter to her fellow church members written December 6, 1902 and published in the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald of January 20, 1903, Mrs. White was looking ahead and especially burdened about the call porter work. And she was, this is a two-part article series in the Review and Herald, and she was promoting her book, Christ Object Lessons. Ever read Christ Object Lessons? You know what that's about? 
That's on the parables of Jesus, and what a powerful book it is. And she really wanted people to read this book and call porters to sell this book. And she talks about her own gift of inspiration. Here's what she says. Sister White is not the originator of these books, referring to her own writings. They contain the instruction that during her life work, God has been giving her. They contain the precious comforting light that God has graciously given His servant to be given to the world. Now, if you read that article through, she's talking so strongly about her writings and promoting them and the inspiration in them that it's almost as though that's ultimately what you should be reading. But in the midst of that article, she makes a single statement that provides clarity and gives the relationship of her writings to the Bible. Just one sweeping statement that clears it up when you read it in the context. She went on to say, From their pages, this light is to shine into the hearts of men and women, leading them to the Savior. The Lord has declared that these books, her books that is, are to be scattered throughout the world. See that strong language about her books? Then by way of amplifying the idea, light is to shine from her writings, she says, The Lord has sent His people much instruction. Line upon line, precept on, on precept, here a little, there a little, referring to her writings. Little heed, here it comes, little heed, and I've given the emphasis here, little heed is given to the Bible. And the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. And I've heard some say that the, the greater light is the light of Jesus, not the Bible. That's misunderstanding the grammar of the statement. The grammatical antecedent to lesser light is that instruction line upon line, her writings. And the grammatical antecedent to greater light is without question the Bible. It is the greater light. Her writings are the lesser light. A beautiful way to spell out with clarity the relationship of her writings to the Bible. It is the final authority. It is the ultimate authority. It is the greater light. She has authority. She has light. But in relationship to the Scriptures, hers is a lesser light. Now let's unpack this a little more. She makes an incidental, incidental reference here to Genesis 1.16. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, the sun, of course. And the lesser light to rule the night, the moon, of course. By analogy, she is saying that the Bible is the greater light. And her writings are the lesser light. This analogy of the sun and the moon as superior, inferior lights is particularly apt because the light that is radiated by the two orbs in the heavens is all the same kind of light. The moon has no light of its own. It simply reflects the light of the sun. What a perfect image for her writings. They reflect the light of Scripture. So Ellen White's writings, therefore, reflect Scripture and exalt Scripture. Scripture, therefore, is the greater light, while her writings are the lesser light. Another helpful analogy came through a woman who was a new convert to Adventism, Mrs. Mrs. S.M.I. Henry. She was a new convert to heaven, excuse me, to Adventism, late in the 19th century. She was a, an evangelical Christian. She was a leader in the Women's Christian Temperance Union, a major evangelical organization of the late 19th century. They emphasized temperance. They were against alcohol and other kinds of abuses to the body. And Seventh-day Adventists felt that in the area of temperance, they could work with them. And Mrs. Henry learned about Adventist truth and was a major leader in this cause and became a Seventh-day Adventist. That's not a story that's well told and well known, but it should be. A major evangelical leader of the 19th century became a Seventh-day Adventist. And when she was in Battle Creek, guess what happened to her? She was learning all these new truths, and a lot of well-intentioned but misguided Adventists shared with her Ellen White's writings. And they really pushed those writings and she received the distinct impression that Ellen White's writings were up there with the Bible. The way these Adventists presented it to her, Ellen White's writings were in addition to the Bible, another part of the Bible. 
And being an evangelical Christian, she was aware of the Mormon movement and their Mormon Bible. This, this troubled her. Wait a minute. Sola Scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. I knew Ellen White had a gift, but I never knew her writings were up, that people taught that they were equal with the Bible. This was a misunderstanding by many Adventists in Battle Creek of all places, the Adventist capital of the 19th century. So she was confused about it, and she wrestled, and she prayed, and her story is told here. And she came up with this analogy after wrestling with the Lord about it because she believed in the Advent message. It was precious to her. She knew it was truth, and she knew that by reading Ellen White's writings, they were a blessing, but their relationship to the Bible really troubled her until she really thought it through and prayed about it. And this, uh, here's the story. So she was converted in 1896. She was a patient at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. She struggled with her health. She wrote an extended and fascinating account about her personal struggle to understand the function of the gift of prophecy in modern times. And she shared that story in this writing. And before I get to the analogy, I should say that at this time, Ellen White was in Australia. And Mrs. Henry and Ellen White developed a correspondence by mail. And they became good mail buddies, if you will. But unfortunately, Mrs. Henry died, and they never met face to face. But Mrs. Henry did share this analogy with her. And Ellen White felt it was an excellent analogy. So in, after wrestling in prayer with God, thinking it through, studying her Bible, she came up with anal the analogy of a telescope. That the spirit of prophecy is best viewed as a lens or telescope through which to look at the Bible. Here's part of her writing about this matter. If the lens is mistaken for the field, we can receive but a very narrow conception of the most magnificent spectacle with which the heavens ever invited our gaze. But in its proper office, proper office as a medium of enlarged and clearer vision, as a telescope, the testimony, and by testimony she means Ellen White's writings, any part of those writings, the testimony has a wonderfully and beautiful and holy office. I mean, what astronomer, astronomer or amateur astronomer is myself who likes to look through telescopes? Who's going to look at the lens? I want to see what the lens are pointing to. She went on to say, a telescope doesn't put more stars into the heavens. It simply reveals more clearly the stars that are already there. Ellen White didn't put new truth to us, different or in addition to in the Bible. She simply brought us greater insight to what's already there and drew us deeper into it. The testimonies are not the heavens radiating with countless orbs of truth, but they do lead the eye and give it power to penetrate into the glories of the mysterious living Word of God. And this insight really blessed Mrs. Henry. And... That became her legacy because she died shortly after this. Denton Reebok, who was an Ellen White specialist of the early to mid 20th century, he said, Sister White herself said that Mrs. S.M.I. Henry had caught the relationship between the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy and the Bible as clearly and accurately as anyone could ever put into words. So that telescope analogy is most helpful. Here's another simple analogy. If I point to the lights up there and say, look at those lights, I don't want you to look at my finger, do I? I want you to look to what my finger is pointing to. Ellen White's writings are like the finger pointing to the Bible. T.H. Jemison, who taught... Adventist heritage and Ellen White studies in the mid 20th century. His textbook, A Prophet Among You, in fact, it was the major textbook throughout a good portion of the latter 20th century. I remember when I took Adventist heritage years ago from, uh, in Ellen White studies from Frank Holbrook at Southern Missionary College at the time. That was the textbook. But he said in this book, after bringing attention to such Ellen White expressions as additional truth is not brought out, that's some phrases that she said relating to her writings in the Bible. And the written testimonies are not to give new light. Jemison posed the question, are there no descriptions given and details enumerated in the Ellen White books that are not mentioned in the Bible? Well, yes. And critics often say, uh-huh. Look at this. 
in Patriarchs and Prophets, she says the serpent in the Garden of Eden, before it fell in to the, to yielded to the tempter, it flew in the sky. She added that to the Bible. You ever read that in Patriarchs and Prophets? It's an amazing narrative. You said the serpent flew through the sky and, and, and all glowed. It looked like bronze flying through the sky. Imagine a big snake flying through the sky. But it was beautiful then. That was before it yielded to the tempter. Critics say, aha, that's adding to the Bible. Is it? Listen. Jemison said, certainly, or there would be little purpose in the giving of these messages. Are these not additional truth and new light? Not at all. The writings introduce no new topic, no new revelation, no new doctrine. They simply give additional details and round out subjects already a part of the scriptural record. The whole realm of spiritual truth is encompassed by the Bible. There is no need for more to be added. That's well said. So the little additional detail of the serpent flying, what does that do? That, you know, the Genesis, Genesis narrative is quite broad. And it leaves room for the sanctified imagination. And that simply heightens the fact that this, this cre uh, creature that God made that yielded to the tempter in the Garden of Eden and was the avenue, the channel that deceived Eve, yielded to sin. And it, it was cursed to the ground. Well, before it was cursed, what was it doing? There's no problem with the idea that it could have been a glorious creature that flew through the sky. That doesn't add to Scripture. That really enhances the narrative. But it doesn't add any additional truth. By the way, that's probably not a detail you want to give to someone on a Bible study for the first time. You know, that needs background to understand what's going on there. One of my students said, well, when I'm describing that, can I, you know, to non-Adventist audiences, can I say that? You know, and I said, well, you don't want to say Ellen White said it. You want to maybe say, it's possible that that could have happened. It's certainly the narrative leaves it open. So she's simply fleshing out some of the details, but not... Uh, contradicting anything that's in the narrative there. He went on to say, but further details, incidents, and applications made in these modern writings lead to keener perception and deeper understanding of the truth already revealed. And I'm bringing this to a close here, but I want to share with you an interesting study that was, it's, it's an older study, it was done in 1980, but I still think the basic principle of the study remains valid today. Uh, Rog, uh, Roger Dudley and Des Cummings uh, did a lot of research back in the 19, late 1970s and 80s, and the subject here was who reads Ellen White? Do church members who regularly read the writings of Ellen White differ significantly from those who seldom do? Both groups were profiled and differences do exist. And the study had a wide range of topics, but I'm just looking at a few here with you. Regarding a strong relationship with Jesus Christ, those Adventists who did read Ellen White, 85% of them said on the forum that they had a strong relationship with Jesus Christ. Of those Adventists who were loyal to Adventism but did not read Ellen White, the non-readers, only 59% said they had a strong relationship with Jesus Christ. Interesting, isn't it? The readers of Ellen White who said they had assurance of salvation, 82% of them who read Ellen White said they have assurance of salvation. Of those Adventists who, who do not read Ellen White, only 59% said they have assurance of salvation. So the more people who read Ellen White, they have a stronger sense of a relationship with Jesus and assurance of salvation. Daily personal Bible study. Those who read Ellen White... 82% of them said they have daily personal Bible study. Of those Adventists who did not read Ellen White, only 47% said they read their Bible daily. What is interesting here that this last item regarding personal Bible study, this is a 35% difference, the strongest of any item in the study. Readers are much more likely to be Bible students than are non-readers. She leads us into the Bible when she's read properly. And I like to share this with audiences as well as my students. I call it the greater light, lesser light circle. We start with the Bible. We should read the Bible more. But the Bible speaks of the prophetic gift. It speaks of inspired writings. 
be, uh, good writings beyond itself. It will create a taste for those writings. That clearly will lead us to read the writings of Ellen White. But her writings, in turn, always point us back to the Bible. So the bottom line is, the Bible is the beginning and ending point for Seventh-day Adventists. At least it should be. Ellen White's writings are not the end. They're a means to the end. The lesser light, greater light circle. I would argue, though, that there, you could say, okay, well, we sh it's so important to read the Bible. Why do we even need Ellen White's writings? Well, it's a gift given to us. God's people possess it. There is a special blessing in it. And while I argue for the supremacy of the Bible, I would also argue that failure to read Ellen White is a loss. We sustain a loss, a personal spiritual loss when we don't read Ellen White. If all you're going to do is read the Bible, well, admittedly, that's, that's good. <laughs> and that is enough. That's certainly enough for salvation. But for special blessing in these last days, those writings have wonderful insights for every one of us personally. So, to summarize here, some of the major themes in these writings, the love of God, the love of God, if you read the Conflict of the Age series, I'll say a, a few words about that tomorrow, it begins in Patriarchs and Prophets, God is love. It goes through the entire plan of salvation, great controversy, it comes to the very end, the last chapter, last page, last paragraph, last sentence, God is love. That is the encompassing theme to her major work on the great controversy. It permeates her writings. The great controversy theme is the major worldview that, Ad, that Ellen White articulates for Seventh-day Adventists. That is our worldview. That's a theme through her writings. Jesus Christ and salvation through Him, only through Him, is a major theme. Radical discipleship, love to God and neighbor. And Ellen White just doesn't say, be a nice disciple of Jesus. She calls for radical discipleship. She calls for 110% of your soul to Jesus. Not 98%. 110 percent. That's radical discipleship. Of course, the centrality of God's Word, the three angels' message and Seventh-day Adventist mission, extremely important theme in her writings, and of course, perhaps her favorite theme, the soon coming of Jesus. So these writings, in a nutshell, this is what they do for us. They generate spiritual vitality, they create a readiness for Christ's coming, and they engender a love for Scripture. The 1909 General Conference was at the end of Ellen White's life. She would die six years later in 1915. She was in Elmshaven at the time. She traveled across the states. She preached all across the United States coming to the 1909 General Conference. She was up in years, and the brethren sensed, as many people did, this would probably be her last General Conference to speak at. So naturally, she was willing. They put her on the speaking docket all through the week. And she preached moving sermons. And she was scheduled for the end of camp meeting or end of, of the general conference session. In those days, they ended it on Sunday afternoon. She had the final message. And all the audience, the world church assembled together. They sensed this would be her last official message to the general conference. And in fact, that would be the last general conference she would attend. And it appears she sensed that. She preached a moving sermon on being partakers of divine nature, a phrase in Peter that Peter uses. And it was a moving sermon. There were many tears when she finished. She put her Bible down. Anybody have a Bible? I need to use this visual here. Let me borrow your Bible just a second. She took her Bible, and she laid it in the pulpit. She laid it on that big pulpit, and she turned slowly to take her seat. You know what? I'll, i got a pulpit right here. She put, laid it on the pulpit, and she turned to take her seat. She paused, and every eye was riveted on her. She turned around, walked back to this Bible, and picked it up. And the audience was expecting more of a sermon. And with arms trembling with age, she held out that Bible before this vast general conference session. And her last official words spoken at a general conference were these. Brethren, I commend to you this book. She placed her Bible on the pulpit 
and took her seat. She could have lifted up the great controversy and said, I commend to you this book or Desire of Ages. Everyone would have appreciated and understood. But no. This was more than just a kind gesture to the Bible. That gesture expressed a passion of her life. A passion of her ministry. To exalt the Bible before God's people. That's the Ellen White I know. How about you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the prophetic gift. It's a blessing to us as a people. It's a personal possession we have. And its function, its purpose is to lead us into a closer relationship with you, into a greater appreciation and experience with your word, the Bible. So thank you, Lord, that we truly are a people of the book, the Bible, more so than we are the books. But we do thank you for those books. They are a blessing to us. Help us to understand and appreciate them better and better each day. So bless us each tonight as we go to our rooms and we sleep in this beautiful environment. May we have a vivid sense of the presence of Jesus. Give us a good night's rest. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.